Welcome back to the Stigma Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Hayes. And as a military veteran and someone who has struggled with addiction and bipolar disorder, I can tell you that today's topic is very personal to me. Every day, many veterans and their families are living with the mental and physical scars from serving their country. And many of them never receive the help or the care that they need. Today's guest, Dr. Anthony Hassan, is president and CEO of the Cohen Veterans Network, which is a nonprofit network of 25 mental health clinics focused on improving quality of life for veterans and their families by providing mental health care through these 25 clinics located in or near dense military populations. Dr. Hassan is a veteran of the United States Army enlisted, and he was an Air Force officer. He has 30 years of experience in the military focused on behavioral health. Many of those years, he served as a military social worker. He has a laundry list of qualifications and experiences. Some of them include having a doctorate in higher education, and he's a graduate of Harvard Business School. He is on an incredible mission to provide mental health care to a population, veterans, that just don't get what they need. So I am very excited about this conversation. Without further ado, I am going to get right into it. So Anthony, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's my privilege, Stephen, and thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. You're doing amazing work, uh, and it's very personal to me what you're doing because of, you know, I'm a veteran. I've struggled with addiction. I've struggled with mental illness myself. So what you're doing is is very, very special, uh, holds a very special place in my heart. I would love to have you kind of tell our audience a little bit about who you are and, and what you've done and how you found your way to being the CEO of the Cohen Veterans Network, if you don't mind. Certainly. uh, Luck has a lot to do with it, let me tell you. Um, I'm a lucky guy to be able to be the leader of the Cohen Veterans Network. You know, it all started a long time ago when I joined the military, enlisted. I was in the Army, and I spent uh, 11 years with artillery and infantry units as a radio operator. I realized I wanted to be an officer and had this desire to help as well, so I became a, a military social worker for uh, the Air Force. So I got out, went to school, came back in, and then uh, served another 14 years as a Air Force uh, social worker. I pretty much was a clinician, and then I ran mental health clinics in the Air Force. I deployed a few times, but it was a great experience. It was a great honor to be able to serve and take care of the people that you serve alongside. So it was a great, great role to have to be a mental health officer in the military is a, is a highlight of my life. I, I finished my career at the Air Force Academy, where I was in the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership. I have my doctorate in higher education. So I retired in 09 after 25 years of service, and I went to the University of Southern California, and I built a research center there focused on veterans and military families, mental health. I always thought I would remain at a university and be a leader within the university setting. I was having a great career. And then I met Mr. Cohen through Admiral Mullen. Admiral Mullen is the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And uh, Steve was on this quest to build a network of mental health clinics to fill gaps in care so that veterans and their families could get help. It's not to replace the VA. It was never intended to do that. It was really to fill gaps in care. And so Steve hired a consulting group, and they put together a simple strategy. Then he hired me, and uh, he said, Anthony, here's $275 million. I want you to go build a mental health network the right way. I want people to have access to high-quality care in beautiful facilities because they deserve it. It all started because his son, by the way, joined the Marine Corps and enlisted after graduating from Brown University. Spent four years in the Marine Corps and came home and encouraged his father to consider Uh, launching a mental health network of clinics. His son is healthy, but his son felt like his friends and their families needed an alternative, another option um, besides the VA. And so here we are. And uh, I remember we started off with the idea of 15 clinics. And then after a short while, Steve really liked what, what was going on. And he said, let's do 25 clinics. So we have 20 clinics operating right now uh, across the country in faraway places like Hawaii and Alaska. We've got a few more to build, and then we'll see what's next. But it's been an amazing ride. Uh, We're making a big difference. We've seen about 25,000 veterans and their family members. We're now seeing active duty, National Guard, and Reserves as well. And so we're filling a critical gap in care, and we're saving lives, saving families, and saving futures of, of these children that we see. So all in all, what an experience to be able to 
build something the right way and make a difference every day. That's amazing. I mean, it's it, it's truly amazing. You mentioned these gaps in care and that the, the network is not really intended to replace what exists. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about what does exist for a veteran and where are those gaps? Yeah, I learned about all this actually when I was at USC in the research center there. We conducted these community surveys of veterans in Los Angeles, Orange County, Chicago, San Francisco. And there's plenty of resources, at least it appeared from our surveys, that veterans were able to find employment resources and housing resources and financial resources. But the one thing that was lacking was the mental health resources. And, you know, the VA isn't for everyone. You know, sometimes your disability might not give you the the the, the rating that you, you need to get priority. Sometimes veterans don't want to go there. Family members can't go there. And so you, you look left and you look right and you really don't see a lot in the community. I speak to it in the way of talking about access. So access to mental health care for anyone in America is very challenging unless you have cash in your pocket. And many of the people who are reaching out for help these days are having a hard time finding the care they need. And veterans are no different. We're just like everyone else. When we become civilians, we have to look for resources in our neighborhood. And frankly, if you've ever tried to get a mental health appointment, pick up a phone and see if your insurance company uh, has a referral and pick up and call that referral and see if they can get you in within a reasonable period of time. And I would bet nine out of 10 times you won't be able to be seen for 30 days. They may or may not even take your insurance. You may have a high deductible or high copayment. And so trying to get help is, is very, very hard to do. And as a veteran trying to navigate this new landscape that you've never been a part of, this civilian landscape, it can be overwhelming. So we wanted to build clinics uh, that were in highly dense veteran communities and military communities where they knew we were there. Uh, We focus a lot on marketing and and, and advertisement so they know that there is a resource there and there are no barriers to care. You can get care with us with or without insurance. If you need a ride, we'll give you a ride to the clinic. If you wanna use telehealth, you can do telehealth from your own home. If you need child care while you're in session, we can make sure you get that. So there is no reason why someone can't get care at a Cohen Veterans Network clinic. But all of that costs a lot of money. And reimbursement with insurances just doesn't cover the cost, period. And so Steve Cohen, because of his philanthropy, he makes us financially whole. He allows us and enables us to make sure that we're giving care uh, to veterans and family members when they need it the most. And that's just not happening in America. If you want good access to a a quality clinician, you're going to pay $200 an hour out of your pocket. That's how you get access to care in America. You don't get access to care by going through the normal channels. It's unfortunate, but that's reality. And so that's what we're doing differently at CVN. We're making sure that we live up to our promise of accessible, quality care, and that once you get in the door, you're going to have routine care. It's not going to be interrupted because you have to wait four weeks for your next appointment, which is terrible. Steve, when we did a study, the America's Mental Health Study in 2018, and we thought stigma was kind of going away because in the survey, people were telling us that they want help. They were asking for help. The problem is when they went to get help, they couldn't get in the door or they didn't take their insurance or they couldn't afford the copayment. So they ended up not getting care or their loved loved ones didn't get care. So here we are. Finally, people are raising their hand saying, I need help. And when they go to get help, it's not available for three, four or five weeks out, some days, 60 days out. You lose motivation. We lose the opportunity to engage them when you have to wait so long. And so, again, at the Cohen Veterans Network, we're trying our best to make sure that never happens to a veteran in the communities that we're in. And we do that because we have the resources to ensure that we have the people in place to meet the needs of those that uh, we care the most about. How do most of the veterans you care for find you? How do they figure out that you're the right place for them to go? How do they find the location? How do they show up on your doorstep and become aware of you and start the process of seeking care. Yeah, again, it goes back to resources. You know, we are able to do a lot of social media marketing. We have a, every clinic has an outreach worker 
in their job, and they're typically a veteran or a military family member that's hired, their job is to connect with community. Their job is to go out onto the military base, go to the VA, go to other resources in the community and let people know we're there. Where our clinics have a community room. We open up our community room so people see us as a place rather than a mental health center, a place to meet, a place to convene, a place to learn. And so quickly we become this this center of gravity, if you would, this place where activity happens, good things happen, and word of mouth. So our number one referral source is a friend or family or relative who's been to our clinic, who's heard about our clinic, and that's amazing to us. We love that. I mean, for your family and friends to tell you to come to our clinic is because they had a great experience. Believe it or not, our second referral source is the VA. The VA and and Cohen Clinics have a great relationship at the local level. We do referrals back and forth. They have family members they send to us. We send veterans there for medical care. So the VA is our second source of referral. And then third, fourth, and fifth are social media. I heard about you from another nonprofit organization. I heard about you from the police, the ER. So you remember, most of our clinics are in these small military communities. So word of mouth travels quickly when you do good things. And so we're in small towns like Fayetteville and Clarksville and El Paso, and people know of us. They know of our clinic. They know where we're at, and it works. It's a small town kind of feel. We become part of their community. In the big cities, a little bit harder for us to kind of market ourselves, but again, we're doing well there too. You had mentioned these high density communities. You had mentioned a couple of these locations. What are some of the other locations? Just, I kind of want to give folks a sense of, of where you are. So if they're living in one of these areas or if, if they know someone in one of these areas, they can, you know, the, the light bulb can go off and they can say, oh, I should tell my, I should tell my veteran friend who lives in that part of the country about this. What, what are some of the other locations where you guys are, are active today? Yeah. And and the good news uh, for today, Stephen, is that before we were doing telehealth at about 16 percent, but now we're doing telehealth a lot. So if you're anywhere in the in the state or a neighboring state, we can help you. But let me list a few. So we're in places like Virginia Beach. Uh, We're in Silver Spring, Maryland by Washington, D.C. We're in Jacksonville, North Carolina, just outside of Camp Lejeune. We're in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is Fort Bragg. We're in Jacksonville, Florida. A lot of navies there. We're in Tampa, which CENTCOM is there. We're in Clarksville, Tennessee at Fort Campbell. Lawton, Oklahoma, we're there at Fort Sill. Dallas, Colleen, Texas, Fort Hood, San Antonio, El Paso, Fort Bliss, San Diego, we're there. We're going to Oceanside, Camp Pendleton area. We're going back to L.A., Uh, We're in Denver. We're going to Colorado Springs, which is Fort uh, Carson and the Air Force Academy. We're in Lakewood, Washington, one of our busiest clinics by Joint Base Lewis McCord. We're in Anchorage, Alaska, outside of JBLM. We're going to Fairbanks, outside of Wainwright. We're also in Honolulu. Uh, We're right outside of Schofield Barracks in Mililani. We have plans to reach Guam. We have plans to reach into Puerto Rico. So wherever you imagine a veteran is or a density of military folks, uh, that's where we are. And we're excited. We're getting ready to open a clinic in Hinesville, Georgia, which is right outside of Fort Stewart as well. And so that rounds out our 25 clinics. Uh, So it's really exciting. But if you're anywhere in the state of California, we can reach you. If you're anywhere in the state of Texas, Colorado, Wherever we are, we we can see you anywhere in that state. And that's why we're starting to see a lot of National Guard and reservists and their family members, because they may not be in Tampa, but they live in a part of Florida and they train with the Guard for Florida and they're eligible for care with a colon clinic. That's incredible. How are you staffing these clinics? How are you finding enough clinicians? I know there's, there's really a shortage of providers out there. Who's working for you? How are you staffing them? Are these veterans that have become therapists or psychiatrists or kind of what what does the the workforce inside the clinic look like? Stephen, that's a great question. It's a question uh, of a challenge, I should say, this clinician challenge that all of us in mental health across the country are having. But in a clinic, we have a handful of staff members like intake worker and receptionist and office manager. We have an outreach worker, a case manager. 
to help our clients and greet our clients and give them great customer service. And then, of course, we have the clinic director and then we have the clinicians. And we typically have four to 15 clinicians in a clinic, depends on how busy a clinic is. A smaller clinic may have four to six clinicians. A larger clinic may have 14 clinicians. And, you know, to your point, it's hard. It's hard to find clinicians. It's hard to recruit. No one's going into mental health these days. The reimbursements are terrible. The salaries aren't the best. And uh, we have a, a shortage of clinicians all across this country. And so we're trying to grow our own. So we work with universities and we bring interns in. And then when they graduate, we bring some of them back as fellows. And then we provide them two years of supervision. We pay them a salary. We give them the best training. We give them great experience. And then we hope that they stay with us. And we've had some success with that. And we, 50% of our, our staff, are veterans or military family members. And so as people PCS or move from base to base, they can transfer right with us. So we've had several military spouses move from one Cohen clinic to another Cohen clinic based on their spouse's PCS move to another uh, fort or, or base. But it, it's hard. You know, we try to pay a little bit higher salary so we can recruit and retain our, our clinicians. But it, it is a, it is a struggle. And, and I, I can't minimize that in any way. And, and all the resources in the world can't help if you don't have the supply. We certainly have a demand. Demand is high. But we work really hard on trying to recruit and retain clinicians. I think that's a market problem. I don't think there'll ever be enough therapists or psychiatrists in, in the market. And that leads me to why I'm in business, which is to fund technological solutions. And I know that you guys have looked at a lot. You've done some research. You've looked at leveraging technology. What, what are some of the things you're doing to force multiply those therapists and psychiatrists that you do have and what are what are some of the technologies that you that you're looking for because you know a lot of a lot of the mental health startup community listens to this podcast there's a lot of founders out there of of solutions that would love to approach you and say I, I'd love to help veterans what are some of the things that you're looking for to multiply the the impact of the clinicians that you do have so we, we definitely are, are needing to compete and so we we need to have a technology, you know, transformation all across mental health. And we see that uh, with groups that you fund and that startups across the country. And certainly we, we're looking for new opportunities to extend our reach to provide that any door is an open door for, for our clients. We want them to have front door access through our app. So we're right now rolling out an app where patients can actually make an appointment and cancel appointment, conduct our telehealth sessions from their app, but also enter our educational resources uh, web area where they can look at all kinds of courses that they can take, asynchronous courses on stress and worry, managing anger and parenting. So we're trying to create this gateway to service through an app. We've created a data hub so we can be very sophisticated with the use of our data so we can then provide better care and, and best practice care and improve access through the use and smart use of data. We're looking at a 360 experience where we use Salesforce and other tools where we can meet a client in the very beginning of their search for help. And then once they're in our system getting help, we can give them and send them information regularly. And when they finish care, that we stay in touch with them digitally through sending them information about their diagnosis or sending them information about an event. So we're trying really hard to have this 360 client experience so that our clients never feel alone and always feel connected to the Cone Clinic. And so we're just looking at those kind of, we're doing that now. So that's our transformation, our digital transformation. But we do know that there are resources out there, asynchronous resources out there that we would be interested in exploring and making part of our app or our virtual uh, education center so that clients can get help without having to uh, have a clinician in front of them. But, you know, all of that is yet to be proven in terms of its efficacy, but we are certainly interested in advancing the field. Imagine we have 25 clinics uh, all under one electronic health record. All of our data is in a centralized data hub. Uh, we have dashboards that make it very easy for us to look at efficiency, productivity, utilization, and access. So we're very sophisticated on the back end. 
which is awesome. But we're always looking for new ways to be more competitive, to add more value for our customers, to generate more value for the organization so we can do more. I have to tell you, we're amazed at our telehealth impact. We went from 16% utilization of telehealth to 100% with COVID. And over the last 16 months, we've been watching our data Um, because I told you we're very data driven. We're seeing just as good, if not better, clinical outcomes for our patients on telehealth. We're seeing longer engagement. In other words, patients are staying in care longer. They normally stayed eight sessions in person. They're staying 10 sessions via telehealth, which is great because the longer you stay in care, the better your outcomes are. But we don't want you to stay in care forever. But we do know that going from eight to 10 sessions, you're going to have greater improvement on your clinical outcomes. And our no-show rates have dropped by four percentage points, which is huge. Patients are keeping their appointments. So that's all good news. And so technology has enabled us to reach people, to get just as good outcomes, and to be more efficient. So we're really excited about the future. We're certainly looking at a hybrid approach to care. Some people want to come in clinics. Some people prefer telehealth. Some people want a combination of both. We think that the app that we've just rolled out is going to be very helpful to people. It's putting access at their fingertips. It puts the phone as their source for their telehealth session. So we're really excited about uh, what's possible. And uh, as a network, we want to advance the field through clinical research. We want to run clinical trials. We want to test new applications out. We want to look at new technologies. So those of you who are out there investing in the mental health space and you're looking for a network to do some pilot testing, uh, we may be uh, an organization you you might want to consider. Excellent. One question that came to mind for me is uh, among the veterans you see, trying, trying to educate the public a little bit on what are the mental health struggles of veterans? What are, what are the common indications that you're treating at a high level across the network? Yeah. Right away, people assume most veterans have PTSD. And uh, I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. About 15, 16% of our total patient population has been diagnosed with PTSD. The majority of our patients come to us for depression, then it's anxiety, and then it's marital, it's child parent challenges, it's transition. You know, life is not easy sometimes, and life can throw us a curveball, and we swing and we miss, and we need someone to help us. And uh, so it's really dealing with grief and loss and family issues and relationship problems. So It's everything that anybody else in life experiences. You know, sometimes we lose a loved one and that sets us back and we need to talk to someone. So, you know, what we're treating and what we're seeing is is a wide variety of mental health challenges. But I would tell you, it's no different than what civilians see and experience. Uh, We are experts at PTSD and trauma, but you know, we're, we're just like any other outpatient mental health clinic across the country. And we're seeing what most outpatient clinics across the country see. And frankly, when I was on active duty, this is exactly what we saw from our patients on active duty. Depression, anxiety, marital, grief, loss, and PTSD. You know, we just conduct, this is another crazy thing that, you know, I wanted to share is that we conducted a, a small pulse survey looking at PTSD awareness because of PTSD awareness month. And so we ask civilians and military people some questions about PTSD to try to understand if they really knew what it was or what it meant or who had it. And, uh, you know, I wasn't shocked that many civilians believe a lot of veterans have PTSD. But what I was shocked with was military people, that's veterans and military active duty, are twice as likely than civilians to believe that the majority of those with PTSD are violent or dangerous. Our own military people are perpetuating this myth that veterans are more violent and dangerous. Listen to this one. Military people, veterans in active duty, and their families are twice as likely than civilians to think that PTSD is not treatable. 
how could military people think that PTSD is not treatable? And I say this with passion because it was disappointing to hear this because I know the military puts a lot of effort, a lot of effort into educating the force about mental health, breaking stigma, having meetings all the time, offering treatment options. It was just so disheartening to hear these statistics because I thought we were making progress, but I'm not sure we are uh, in the area of stigma. How could we not think that PTSD is treatable? There are so many active duty members that have PTSD that are doing very well. They're getting promoted. They're deploying. They're taking care of family. That's just crazy. And to think that veterans with PTSD are more violent and dangerous? That's another myth. Where's that coming from? So we, we've got still got a lot of work to do, not only in the military community, but in the civilian community around mental health stigma. I think the stigma is a killer. I think stigma prevents people from feeling like they can get help, feeling normal. I think it makes them think that if they get help, they'll be branded. They'll have a scarlet letter. They won't be able to be like their fellows or their peers. I think the stigma... I've had a very personal experience with this and I'm just, I'll just share this with you. I don't have anecdotal data for this, but you know, look, I went to rehab in 2018 uh, for addiction. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I, I've been through a lot, a lot of it caused by me and my own actions in my addictions. But I will tell you, nobody kicked me harder when I was down than people I knew in the military. Then, yeah, I mean, for me, I went to West Point, then a lot of folks just you know, won't return my call, won't return my text, won't, I mean, won't speak to me anymore. I feel like the military veterans community is perpetuates the stigma of veterans more than any, more than any other group out there. What do we do about that? Yeah. You know, Stephen, that, that is such a good question, you know, and I fought that the whole time I was a mental health officer. I tried to give example after example after example of people who would come to see me for mental health care and how well they would do and they get promoted and they would PCS and they had a great career and they would read. Nobody wants to hear that. They believe that if you go to mental health, it's going to end your career and you're going to get booted. Or they think, as you've said, you're weak, you're a failure, you're not like us, you know, you know, that going to mental health is career ending. You're not strong. You're the weak link. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, you look at this idea of stigma reduction and what people talk about. They talk about doing more education. How much more? Find, you know, ambassadors and people who can advocate and get champions. And so we do. We get leaders in front of formations and in town hall meetings who talk about getting help. Who's listening, you know? It's these testimonials you try to talk about and give good examples of how marriages have been saved and lives, lives have been saved, but yet it still goes on and on and on. And it's tiring. It's frustrating for those of us in the field who want to do better and want to help. And and I wish I could tell you, here's the, here's the answer. Here's what we got to do to reduce stigma. Uh, I've tried it. I think the military's effort and the, time when, the times when I was deployed, I think this might be part of a solution, but I don't know if it is. But when I was deployed, I was living in the tents. I was part of the unit. I was right there. That made a difference. People came up to me. People built a trust with me. I could talk to them without sitting in a clinic. I was walking around. I was sitting outside of the mess tent or the defect. You know, we were walking around the perimeter talking about things that were going on back home or how they were feeling or the, the critical incident or the, the IED, whatever it was, they talked to me and I felt so needed more than I ever felt needed when I was back in, in garrison or back on base. So I think this idea of embedding mental health closer to the units, putting them in the units has merit and has an opportunity to work. But it was almost like it was okay to do it when you were deployed because nobody really kind of knew. But it's not okay when you have to go into the clinic and your commander knows and everybody knows, right? So I don't know if we're ever going to get past that, but I hope that we can make slow improvements there. 
My other thought, as I mentioned earlier, though, Stephen, no matter what we do to reduce stigma, if you can't get help when you need it, it just reinforces or gives the person another opportunity to say, see, they're not ready for me or this wasn't meant to be. And then they they go back to their old ways and we lost the opportunity. We lost that moment when we don't have access, when we're not there for them, when they need us, we're done. One of my classmates from the academy took his own life a couple of weeks ago. Good friend of mine from school drank himself to death right after he got home from being overseas. And every time it happens, we sit around and we talk about, wow, well, we should have been there. I, I, I would have answered the phone. I, hey, let's all check on each other. Let's share this 1-800 number hotline. That, that, that gets shared and passed around for a few days. And then it's back to status quo and nobody, then it happens again. And I just, I hope this stops. It's got to stop. Yeah, Stephen, I, I feel helpless too. And uh, the good news is uh, there are 25 places that people can get help. And there's 25 places that are ready to help. And there are no barriers. And for those that have the courage and who can put aside the stigma and really focus on on themselves, uh, we're ready for them. And we're ready to take care of them. We're ready to support them. We are saving lives. But it's a tough, tough hill to climb. And, you know, stigma, underfunded establishments, the lack of mental health resources. I could go on and on and on and and remain negative, but I am very excited about what we're doing in the 25 communities that we're in because we're making a difference and and we know we are, and it's beautiful to see, but you know, we're just one organization and uh, one organization. What's the long-term vision for the organization? Where do you, where do you see it going? You know, what kind of funding is needed? I know Steve's, you know, Mr. Cohen's bared the brunt of it. You know, is there other funding needed? Are you looking for other donors? What? How do you think about what the CVN is going to be in five or, or ten years? Yeah, so we're we're going to be twenty five clinics here real soon this year, and we're asking ourselves what's next. My thought is, well, Steve, we built this system with all this back office structure. And we're supporting veterans and military families in almost every corner that we can. We certainly could do a little more here and there, but I think we've we've got it covered. We can do more. What if we could take what we've built and do something for another special population? Why not leverage the network you've built, Steve, to to do more good while we still do good for our veterans, of course, and their families and active duty? But, you know, it's like more revenue we can bring in, the more revenue meaning the more philanthropy, the more state grants, the more third party insurance reimbursement, the more that we can bring in, the more people we can get to partner with us, the more we can do on the other end. And so we have a multi pronged sustainment strategy. And so I'm constantly looking for other philanthropists, other wealth engines to bring funding to the network so we can do more. I'm always talking to state city and county governments. And uh, many of them have been supporting us and standing up and and providing some financial backing for for our clinics. And we're always looking for foundations and philanthropy to to join us. And we've had some success there. And of course, we're billing insurances when we can, but we don't want to leave any money on the table. And we don't ever want to think people to think that, uh, you know, Mr. Cohen can do this all on his own. We know that uh, we can do more if we're able to raise more. And so we're always looking uh, to do that. And anybody interested in in helping us have an impact, uh, we certainly want to hear from them. And whatever this new population is, we're excited that we're going to be able to perhaps help another special sector who can benefit from having a clinic in their backyard that gives them the access and quality that they deserve. That's amazing. How do people get in touch? What's the right way for folks, whether it's donors, whether it's potential startups that have a tech idea they want to pilot with you, whether whether it's people in other populations who want to say, hey, let's explore the idea of using this model in our population. How how do people get in touch with you guys? Yeah. So obviously the first place you can go to is coenveteransnetwork.org. That's our website. You can learn more about us there. 
you certainly can email me uh, at anthony.hassan at cohenveteransnetwork.org. And we also have phone number uh, phone numbers on our website. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear about your ideas. We'd love to hear about how you might be able to help us advance our, our cause. And, uh, you know, is there a population that would benefit from having a clinic in their backyard dedicated just to them and for them? You see, the strategy here is it has to be defined. You can't do everything for everyone. But if you can target your intervention or your community or your zip code, then you can provide access and quality care. The problem is that so many of our partner organizations out there are struggling with 1% margin at best of profit because they've been tasked with an impossible task. And that's to take care of hundreds of thousands of lives under under their roof. And that's just impossible. So that's what the difference is when you have a colon clinic. A colon clinic is a clinic designed for a special population in a defined area. You have to control it. And it's it's not fair for other people who can't access it, but it's how we're able to do what we do. That's awesome. Look, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to to come here and to share about what you're doing with us and talk about this topic. Is there something obvious that I should have asked that I missed? Is there anything else on your on your heart that you want to want to share with our population? No, Stephen. I, I mean, I'm I'm like you. I mean, I wish things were different. I wish stigma wasn't there. I wish access was available. But I I'm very proud and very happy and and thankful for Mr. Cohen and his generosity because I know that we've seen twenty five, twenty six thousand families. And we've made a difference. So all I have to say in closing is that, you know, when you can do what we do, you can save lives and save families and save futures. And, uh, you know, I I just wish we can do this for all Americans. Yeah, I think maybe we will get the chance to. That's my goal, too. I hope so, buddy. And thank you for your time. And uh, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing how technology and uh, future advancements will create greater access for for many more. So I'm standing by and uh, always ready to, to consider something new. Thank you again, Dr. Hassan, for being here today and for the work that you're doing. You're saving lives. You're saving lives in a population that's often overlooked. And I'm just really grateful that there's someone like you and there's someone like Mr. Cohen who would put this much time and this much money and this much effort in to taking care of that that population, the veteran population. I hope this conversation that we had today promotes a discussion in the military, the veteran population among civilians that's long overdue and that people who need help may find out about this opportunity to get help from the CVN from this podcast or you know, from our conversation or from maybe some of the social media uh, sharing that will happen afterwards. To our listeners, thank you for being here. And please, if you like this conversation, if you like this content, please give us a subscribe or a like or a review on your podcast platform of choice. To the mental health and digital health founders out there of startups, don't forget to join the Mental Health Startup Slack community, which you can find a link to in the show notes. And don't forget to check out the What If Fellowship, which is an eight-week program designed to help facilitate increased company building within the mental and digital health space where we aim to help mental health startups and digital health startups accelerate the process of going from an idea to a real plan to execution and funding. You can learn more about that through the fellowship tab on the What If Ventures website, which we'll link to in the show notes. And finally, we really want to hear from our listeners. Please do comment on social media. Let us know what you liked or what you want to hear more of or what you disagreed with. You can reach out to us on Twitter at StigmaCast, on Instagram at StigmaPodcast. You can email us, info at StigmaPodcast.com. And obviously, you can find us on our website, which is stigmapodcast.com. Thank you again for being here. And until next time, stay safe, be well, and thank you for your support.